Well, certainly I think that the relationship between creativity and imagination is the place to focus if you want to understand uh, the emergence of form out of chaos. Of all the arguments that you make in favor of the theory of morphic resonance, I think the most powerful one is this question, uh, if the laws of nature are eternal, where were they before the Big Bang? It seems to me that just defeats the whole notion of eternal laws of nature because you either have to uh, hypothesize a kind of platonic superspace in which for reasons presumably unknowable uh, these were the laws that were present or you have to somehow say that the laws of nature came into being complete and entire at the moment of the Big Bang and it's very hard to see how laws of nature such as uh, gene segregation and uh, uh, that sort of thing could exist in the situation of high temperature physics and non-molecular systems that prevailed at the beginning of the universe. So my thinking about how pattern came to be in, in the universe has sort of taken all the orthodox positions and stood them on their head. And I think that's a useful place to begin. How would it be, or is it credible that perhaps what the universe is, is a kind of system in which more advanced forms of order actually influence previous states of organization. This is what is emerging in Ralph Abraham's work with the uh, chaotic attractors. They are attractors. That means that they exert influence on less organized states and pull them toward some kind of end state. And for me, the key to unlocking what is going on with history, creativity, progressive uh, process of all sorts is to place uh, the state of completion at the end, but to see it as a kind of higher dimensional object which casts an enormous and flickering shadow over the lower dimensions of organization of which this universe is one. So that, for instance, in the human domain, when we look at history, what we see is an endless series of anticipations. The golden age is coming. The Messiah is immediately around the corner. Great change is soon to be upon us. These are intimations of change. It's almost as though the transcendental object that is the great attractor in many, many dimensions uh, throws out images of itself which filter down through these lower dimensional matrices and actually are the basis of the appetition of nature for greater expression of form, the appetition of the human soul for greater immersion in beauty, the appetition of human history for greater expression of complexity. So um, when I think about these terms, chaos, creativity, imagination, I see them, it's like a three-stroke engine of some sort. Each impels and runs the other and sets up uh, a reinforcing cycle that then stabilizes uh, organisms, processes that are caught up in this in the phenomenon of being. The phenomenon of being is this self-synergizing engine of a, out of chaos, through creativity, into the imagination, back into chaos, 
out into creativity, uh, so forth and so on. And it operates on many levels simultaneously so that the planet is undergoing a destiny. The model, you know, deep time, the time of geology was only really discovered around the turn of this century. And it is cosmically uh, ennobling to, to think of the universe as a thing of great age. But I think that it's time to put in place next to the notion of deep cosmic time, the notion of chaotic, uh, sudden uh, change, cusp flux, and sudden perturbation. Because at the, what deep time has revealed, as we've pushed our understanding of the career of organic life back 65 million years, 270 million years, what we see is tremendous punctuation built into the universe in the case of the Earth in the form of asteroidal impacts. This thing which happened 65 million years ago, nothing larger than a chicken walked away from it on this planet. So it, there's a strange paradox where <laughs> taking deep time seriously, the message of deep time is you may not have as much time as you thought, that the universe is dynamic, capable of turning sudden corners. So then the imagination becomes a kind of beacon. The imagination is, as it were, a scout sent ahead or a, a, uh, something which has preceded us into history and in fact is a kind of eschatological object. It is shedding uh, influence, the morphogenetic field if you wish. If the morphogenetic field is not subject to the inverse square law of decreased influence over distance, then I, as a layman, don't see why, Rupert, we couldn't uh, locate it at the conclusion of process. Because, you know, one of the things that's always puzzled me about the Big Bang is uh, it's a singularity. This is the term physicists use for it. This means theory cannot predict it and yet it is necessary to make everything which follows from it happen. So you just say, you know, there's no reason for this, we have no argument for this, but the rest of the theory needs it, so it's a singularity. And the immense improbability which modern science rests on, but cares not to discuss, is this. The belief that the universe sprang from nothing in a single moment. Well, if you can make that leap to believe that, <laughs> it's very hard to see what you couldn't believe. That is almost the limiting case of credulity, I would think. You know? So in order to save the phenomenon, I would propose a different idea. That, uh, and it, I think it is eminently reasonable, and it is that as the complexity of a system increases, so too does the likelihood of its generating a singularity or an unpredictable perturbation. So the, the pre-existent state of the universe, I imagine to be extremely simple, an unflawed nothingness. In other words, the least likely situation in which you would expect a singularity to emerge. But now let's look at the other end of the historical continuum of the history of the universe. Uh, let's look at the uh, world we are living in, which is full of uh, 106 elements, tremendous gradients of energy ranging from the what's going on inside pulsars and quasars to what is going on inside viruses and cells, tremendous organizational capacity at the atomic level, at the molecular level, at the level of molecular polymerization, 
at the level of membranes and gels, at the level of uh, cells and organelles, organisms, societies, uh, so forth and so on. In other words, the universe at this moment is a tremendously complicated, integrated, multi-leveled, dynamic thing. And every passing moment, it becomes more so. This is what evolution, history, compression of time, what all these things are attempting to indicate, is the increasing complexity of reality. Well, then, is it not reasonable to suspect that if a singularity is necessary to explain this universe, that singularity must emerge rather near the end of the complexification process rather than its beginning. You see, we simply have to reverse our preconceptions about the flow of cause and effect, and then we get a great attractor that pulls all organization and structure toward itself over several billion years. And as uh, the objects of its attraction uh, grow closer to its proximity, they somehow interpenetrate. Uh, they set up uh, standing wave patterns of interference. New possible, uh, new properties become emergent and the entire thing complexifies. Well, to my mind, this is um, uh, the divine imagination. This is what Blake called it. This is the only way I can conceive of it, that uh, Rupert and I were chatting last night in our room about the aboriginal nature of God, this idea which is built into Whitehead, that somehow time is the theater of God's becoming. But it's also, from the point of view of a higher dimensional manifold, a kind of feat accompli. And this is no contradiction, or if it is, it's all right, because in these realms of higher ontology, you're always asked to avoid closure and hold the notion of a coincidencia positorum, a union of opposites. The thing is both what it is and what it is not, and yet it somehow escapes contradiction, and that's how uh, the open system is maintained. That's how uh, the miracle of uh, life is possible. So I sort of think of the divine imagination as uh, the, the class of all things both possible and beautiful. It's a kind of reverse Platonism. The attractor is at the bottom of a very deep pit into which all phenomena is uh, cascading and being brought into a kind of compressed state. This is happening in the biological realm through the career of the evolution of life, which paleontological uh, data makes clear. But it's also simultaneously happening uh, in the world as we experience it within our culture. In other words, what we call history. History is uh, the, the tracks in the snow left by creativities wandering in the divine imagination. And if you are a student of theories of history, you know that these tracks in the snow, what is taught in modern universities these days, is that these tracks in the snow are going nowhere. The technical term is trendlessly fluctuating. And we're told that history is this kind of process. It's trendlessly fluctuating. It goes here, it goes there. It's called a random walk in information theory. It means you just wander around. And Well, it's very interesting. Now we begin to see through the marvel of, uh, of the new mathematics that random walks are not random at all that a sufficiently long random walk becomes a fractal structure of extraordinary depth and beauty. So you see, really what has to happen partially this weekend 
is for us to see chaos not as something that degrades information and is somehow the enemy of order, but rather chaos is the birthplace of order. Chaos is not the problem. Chaos is uh, the answer. It's the inability to surrender that is the major cultural problem. This is because everybody's personality is structured around the male ego, this tumorous growth that has come upon us since the collapse of the Gailanic worldview that was practiced in the ancient Middle East. This shift of emphasis from collective tribal values to the, the me values and uh, away from partnership and toward domination is uh, typical of the resistance of this need to surrender to the imagination. It amazes me. I was somewhere recently and two people who I didn't know were sitting at a table next to me in a restaurant and one of them was explaining to the other one something about the dynamics of the atmosphere and the person to whom it was being explained was very intently trying to understand this complex phenomenon. And I thought to myself, amazing. These people go at this as though the weather wouldn't happen unless they understood its functioning. And they place great importance upon it. We each place great importance upon our own uh, ability to understand reality as though you were an understudy for God or something, <laughs> so that if anything happened and they tapped you, you'd be able to say, that's all right, I can handle it, I understand thermodynamics and all this stuff. No problem. No pro well, this is uh, not exactly uh, this abandonment to the partnership life lived in the creative imagination uh, that I had in mind. Well, we could go on and on about this, but I hope this has stirred up. <laughs>